welcome to TheOos.TV. My name is Spencer Burke, your host for Think Forward. Today we're, in, we're together with Matt Sorens, and he has written a book, Welcoming the Stranger. Now, let's just jump right into it. What is the most difficult issue you encounter with the church and immigration? I would say, you know, interacting with churches and with individual Christ followers, there's a whole range of attitudes towards this issue. So there are some people who, you know, come in and I don't really have to convince them of anything. But there's definitely, and if you poll, particularly polling evangelical Christians, there's a lot of misconceptions about immigration and about immigrants themselves and about who these people are. There's a lot of fear, I would say, really. The people are afraid of people who are coming from a different culture, speaking a different language, sometimes, you know, looking very different than people in this, than the majority culture of the United States. So there's a lot of misconceptions and some of those um, are sort of built around some half-truths and some of them are really just invented and Unfortunately, a lot of that gets repeated by TV people and radio people that maybe have their own opinion on this issue that's not necessarily well conformed to the facts. But um, So a lot of my job is just education. And my fundamental goal and my, my co-author's goal with this book isn't necessarily to convince anyone this is what, you know, the immigration policy that we should have or this is what you ought to be doing as an individual. But it's to say we need to step back from the rhetoric and then to understand, to think critically and, and biblically, but how do we as Christians engage with this decidedly complicated topic? I mean, you're not going to hear me say that this is simple. Right. It seems like the marks of Christianity should be love, care, compassion, welcoming the stranger. It seems like the context I hear Christianity and immigration are fear, anger, suspicion, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and uh, maybe even them and us and border gates and sure, fences sure. and, you know, help me put that together. Sure. <laughs> you know, I think people feel attention, but in some ways I think it's a false attention too, because yes, we need to think about the law, and I think the rule of law is extremely important, and you won't hear me say that it's not, but we can't stop at the question of, of what is the law. We need to go beyond that too. Is this law just? Because we can change laws in this country. I mean, that happens every single day. And as uh, for those of us who are citizens, and have, we have the, the opportunity and the responsibility to inform what policies our, our country takes on, on immigration or on any other issue. And that goes to one of the, the big misconceptions, is that, well, why don't those people go into the legal way? Why don't they wait their turn in line? And um, for most people who are in this country without legal status, there was no line to get into. There is no legal way for them to immigrate. I mean, there are several ways that you might get a, an immigrant visa to the United States, basically through family connections, through work, if you're highly skilled, um, through something called a diversity visa lottery, which is a lottery but only for certain countries, and through refugee or asylum um, status, which means you're fleeing persecution. But a lot of people don't fit into one of those groups. So you may have family here, but they're your cousins, and your cousins can't submit a petition for you. You may want to come and work here. Almost everyone, that's why they come here. But you want to work in what we would consider a low-skill job, and there's no visas for that in most situations. Um, you may not come from a country that has a, a lottery, and it, you know it's a lottery, so you probably didn't win. And you may be fleeing poverty, but you're not fleeing persecution because of your religion or your ethnicity, or one of the other reasons that are qualified under the law. So for a lot of people, there's no lawful way to enter, but there's all these jobs in the United States. Even in the, you know, it's a tough economy right now, but there's still jobs that immigrants are filling, and, and immigrants respond to the economy. So when the economy goes down, right now the net flow from Mexico is going out. Yeah, it's uh, funny. Without, you know, people will credit that to border policies. It has a lot more to do with economic policies. Right. Well, and a, a lot of people talk about it from a policy point of view. A lot of people talk about it from a theoretical point of view. You've done both and. You're talking about it from a theoretical, but you're also right in the middle of the game. Absolutely. Talk to me a little bit about uh, where you live and what you're doing. Sure. So my neighborhood um, is out in the western suburbs of Chicago. It's an extremely diverse community, really low-income community within a city, a, a town that is really wealthy. It's one of the you know, wealthiest towns in the state of Illinois. But my neighbors, um, you know, most of them are underneath the poverty guidelines. So, and most of them are foreign born, um, from, mostly from Mexico, as well as a good number from refugees from Africa, from Sudan, Somalia, Sudan, um, Tanzania, Burundi, some from Burma, um, and other parts of Southeast Asia. So it's an extremely diverse community. We, we've got you know, about a dozen or two dozen languages going around. Uh, and for me, it's so much fun because I get to enjoy food from all these different countries. And really, some of my best friends now are my neighbors in this community. 
um, which means that they invite me to their house and I get to eat their food and you know help their kids with, with homework. But it also means that I hear their stories and I this is a very personal issue for me. It's not just a policy issue. It's not just a biblical issue on a theoretical realm. I guess one of the things that's really frustrating for me would be just there's so much misinformation. I mean, to hear people say, you know, those, those lazy immigrants who are either stealing our jobs or they're lazy, doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> right. But, and they don't pay taxes and they're a drain on public resources and they're bringing disease and they're committing crimes. And of course there are immigrants who commit crimes. Of course there are some who are a drain on public resources. A lot of U.S. citizens are a drain on public yeah. resources if you want to look at it that perspective. But most immigrants are paying taxes. The Social Security Administration says three out of four undocumented immigrants are paying their taxes. And they're not eligible for social security benefits. So it's, it's really, an, it can be a very exploitative thing. I mean, my neighbors pay in their social security payroll taxes. They're supporting you know, elderly people in this country, my grandparents, yeah. who are very grateful for it. And of course, the social security administration is, has its own issues right now. They're not about to send that money back. They send a letter back. So most employers, if they're paying any attention, should be aware that you know this person probably doesn't have a valid social security number. But, they want a hard worker, and these workers, you know, these immigrants want to work and want to support their families. So it's frustrating to hear them be the scapegoats for everything. To value immigrants exclusively based on economic considerations is also a problem. I think from a Christian perspective, particularly, yeah. um, immigrants are more than what they can contribute to our affluence. Right. And that's a very dangerous way as, as Christians to, to look at people's worth in humanity. Mm -hmm. People made in the image of God who bring um, you know, a diversity to the church, to our society, that lets us celebrate the diversity of how God has made human beings. You're an immigrant. That's the easiest, quickest way to say someone else deal with it. Well, the easiest, quickest way is to call them an alien. <laughs> alien, even <laughs> which, more interesting. Yes. Which I mean, and there's nothing inherently wrong with that word. It's yeah. in the Bible, and it's it's in the dictionary, it's in the immigration laws. There's no offense and intent, you know, intended by that word. But when I hear the word alien, I think of a three-headed green monster. Um, from Mars, and not a human being made in the image of God. You know, and it, it's a very dehumanizing language. I mean, we it's, it lumps these immigrants, most of whom, the vast majority of whom, came for no other reason other than to get a better life for themselves, for their families, sometimes to be with their families, sometimes fleeing persecution. It lumps them together with you know rapists and murderers and kidnappers. Not that we should dehumanize them either, no. but it's it, it's an unfair sort of characterization, I think. Mm -hmm. I think another thing that's kind of interesting is, um, you know, when you decide to be born, you know, you don't fill out a passport. Absolutely. You end up somewhere, you know. And I think privilege is something that's fascinating. That Christians, you know, like, I was here. What is my country? I was here. Right. For, you know, and that is an interesting thing that we don't really look at the whole body of Christ and right. see, you know, arm, hand, feet, you know. Sure. So, you know. Yeah, I'd say... You know, there is a strange sense of entitlement that, of course, I deserve this because I was born in Wisconsin, but you were born in Michoacan, so you do not deserve this. And I'm going to live to be 73, and you're going to live to be 10 years less than that because of where you're born, and that's the way it's supposed to be. And I think, you know, from a realist political perspective, maybe that makes sense. I don't know how to reconcile that with my Christian faith, with people being made in the image of God, with the idea that. Uh, that we are brothers and sisters, you know, if my brother, despite where he was born, needs medical treatment or needs, you know, a decent job to support his family, I'm not going to tell him, well, too bad you were born in the wrong country. These are our brothers and sisters. In many cases, um, you know, the church is more vibrant in a lot of the places that immigrants come from than it is in the United States. That's not to say that borders are all, you know, illegitimate or that we can't have the rule of law. Of course we need to do that. And no one, you know, we're not necessarily advocating for open borders or any of that sort of thing. But we can have laws that are more compassionate, more just, more sensible. I mean, ultimately, this issue makes some funny sort of partners is politically because you have business interests who want more workers with a human rights organization who want people to be able to migrate freely when there's a job available and when it's in their interest to keep them and everyone really wants people to be in legal status. Yeah. Nobody thinks yeah. it's a good situation to have all these people here illegally. It's a terrible situation. It's terrible for the immigrants themselves. It's, it's not good for society either when we say that we value the rule of law. But the big missing link right now is to have a legal mechanism for people to enter. Right. And that's the missing piece that most people don't even realize is not there. Yeah. Well, it's going to be fun journeying with you on this. I know it's much more complicated, but we'll continue to struggle with this and think it through. So thanks Great. so much for taking the time. Thank you so much. Yeah.